for example, if we're in backwardation, which is what I saw for about three weeks straight, where the physical market became more expensive. People actually wanted to take the physical delivery uh, of the product because of, you know, whether it's volatility, whether it's Russia, you know, concern out there. There was just a need to own the physical versus trust of the futures delivery maybe three months out. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. And quite excited because I know someone I've been promising on the show for last couple of weeks, Bob Coleman of goldsilvervaults.com, who really has a great look inside the wholesale level of the market. A lot of the things going on with gold and silver. Bob, you've had some great comments on your Twitter feed lately, pointing out things that I think most people don't have access to, including the EFP levels, premiums, at an interesting note on GLD saying that basically good luck ever getting your gold out of there no matter who you are so bob it's great to have you back on the show probably been too long but nice to have you here and how's everything going with you today sure good chris how, how you doing it's it's been uh kind of crazy on our end so uh but yeah definitely how are you doing i'm doing well and i think People are confused in general. We have the Fed raking, ra raising rates even faster than most expected. Inflation still soaring despite that. So love to start off with what you're seeing on the wholesale market of gold and silver, and then we can take it from there. Yeah, on the you've seen the last couple of weeks, um, wholesalers finally started bringing premiums down. So, you know, you should be able to probably contact your your retail dealer, and they should probably you know, premiums should be down on their end as well. Um, like for example, you know, we're you know, I think uh, we were selling hundred ounce pamp silver bars at two ninety over spot. Um, a couple of weeks ago or three weeks ago, now they're at 230 over spot. So, so it gives it gives you a little bit of flair for maybe how much things have come down. You know, maybe about 80 cents or so, um, which helps. I mean, I, I think uh, it, it to me it's trying to get the the consumer more um, uh, involved in our world, the physical world, rather than pricing them out and having them go to the ETFs or some type of structured product or something of that nature. So it's nice to see that uh, you know the, the market has slowed down enough where um, you see some of these premiums pull back. Um, the, the, one of the things I was looking at when we started to initially get that sell-off a few weeks ago, uh, you were mentioning the EFP or exchange for physical premium. Uh, basically, that's a differential rate between the London market and New York market, and so you try to understand you know, whether the futures are more expensive or less expensive than the than the actual physical product, uh, and then that spread because the EFP is just basically a spread. So it's just a, it's a way to measure is the futures more expensive or is the physical more expensive. So it can give you an indication if, if for example, if we're in backwardation, which is what I saw for about three weeks straight, where the physical market became more expensive. People actually wanted to take the physical delivery uh, of the product because of, you know, whether it's volatility, whether it's Russia, you know, concern out there, you know, uh, there was just a need to own the physical uh, versus uh, trust of the futures, uh, uh, you know, delivery maybe three months out. And so you saw that backwardation. That backwardation got actually pretty extensive and it, it floated through actually all four precious metals at the same time. And that's what I was kind of trying to put that out there, trying to educate people that, you know, that's something to look at. Um, the backwardation did kind of let off and we basically kind of gone flat almost um, where the, 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 the physical, well, I should say last week you had the, the role, the new contract lead month uh, become established. And so the old month kind of rolled off. Um, so, so when they rolled the new contract or the new lead month, which is a couple months forward, naturally the price of that contract is a little bit more expensive than say the, 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 the lead month or the front month that, that's, that's, uh, that's expiring. So when that happened, you went to a contango in, in some a slight contango on some of the the spreads, um, but really the, the the market action that we've seen the last week or week and a half has really been dictated by the general market um, and this upcoming uh, 
quantitative easing now that's actually in that, that's now now where the fed is starting to reduce their balance sheet and and that effect is having a huge impact on the general market it's having an impact on the fixed income market uh uh as well as um margins and leverage and there's a lot of forced selling a lot of unwinding that's going on and that's i think impacting the precious metals world um uh, because the selling that we've seen here the last especially the last week has been mainly paper selling it hasn't been uh the physical market just saying hey listen i'm done get me out i don't trust the market anymore uh it, this has really been more of a margin call liquidation and then friday we had a huge rally um which was i kind of I, I had a spaces call talked about that a little bit uh on twitter where it was more short covering you want to watch the pullback see how strong the market actually is on the pullback but obviously we've seen that the the, the general market sell off pretty hard and that's kind of floated through um uh with um uh you know not only in the general market but also our world world as well one thing to note though that for for the retail crowd um and this could impact the premiums on precious metals not necessarily the spot price but there are a lot of uh borrow against your gold programs out there or gold leasing or financing programs um and a lot of these players a lot of retail dealers have gotten into this market it's been sort of a, a way to say hey listen i want to broaden my revenue stream so now i'll make money on a spread of loaning uh you know money out against the metal as collateral well th these loan to value uh ratios are probably being hit at this point and so you're seeing maybe some forced selling some margin call activity where people are either having to pony up money to, to pay down their loan against their physical gold, or they're actually having to sell gold or, or silver, whatever the metal may be that they have a loan against. So that may be some stuff that retail dealers are being impacted by that have those types of programs. So there isn't, it's that secondary supply that's coming back onto the market so that you don't have, that takes away from the typical brand new wholesale demand uh, that we would normally see, uh, like when the prices get creamed and and you have this buy in the dip mentality maybe a lot of the you're seeing retail dealers have maybe more two way action where they're not as um uh, uh you know they're they're not necessarily buying brand new product from from the wholesaler um and that, so that might be something to consider and watch out there yeah that makes a lot of sense <coughs> excuse me and in terms of what you mentioned with the EFP especially when i saw your note a few weeks ago the first thing it reminded me of was what happened back in March of 2020, right after the Fed started their latest quantitative easing program. Now, again, there they were easing versus here, they're tightening, theoretically going to tighten more. Although that was around when we saw silver go to 12 and then eventually skyrocket back and we saw issues with the EFP mechanism in the gold market. And again, to see the EFP premiums that you talked about get higher while we were seeing this silver sell off, there were some similarities, some differences, but how would you compare those two different data points? Yeah, that was an interesting period because there you went into a very extreme contango. Like March, when Ukraine uh, was invaded by Russia, um, we went into a very sharp contango where the futures market became very expensive relative to the physical spot price. And, and that's what you're referring to in March of 2020, when you had about a $65, $70 difference between the New York price and the London price. Well, what, what I think happened, um, well, in, in March of 2020, what basically happened was you had this sort of food chain or this, this product chain kind of get cut and where you, you know typically you couldn't deliver physical product into the market so you and you typically in, in the comex you typically use that market as a hedging uh instrument it's not necessarily a price setting in instrument as used as a hedging instrument by commercials and 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 whether they're fabricators users producers uh wholesalers retail dealers whatever it may be um and we can get into that too um but but uh, what you had was you had in March of 2020 this flush in price to the downside, which wiped out a lot of people that were long, so, uh, and so they they were four sellers. And then when uh, the Fed came in and it just uh, 
flooded the money, flooded the system with money, all of a sudden the shorts, which were typically rolling their contracts forward, so they had to buy back their short position and then sell maybe three months out, two months out, whatever the next lead month contract was, there was no liquidity to get out. Uh, because there were no longs left to sell to or to buy from. Um, and so uh, it was it, it, it basically created this vacuum up in price. Um, and you got that, you know, HSBC, I think, lost like $75 billion uh, that month or that one day alone. Well, fast forward to March of, of this year when Ukraine got invaded, Barclays had um, uh, they have a set of uh, uh, their exchange traded vehicles uh but they're um uh they're based on like they have silver and gold and different types of commodities but what they do is barclays has um uh where they they put their money into futures contracts rather than the actual underlying commodity and so you had this massive move or massive flow of money coming into commodities when ukraine was invaded because you started getting dislocations everywhere and 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 that that actually shot the contango up and that made, so basically all this money that came in into the market where institutions were looking for securities to put, you know, to get participation in commodities. Cause a lot of them can't just simply buy the physical commodity and maybe against their charter. So when they went in, bought all these futures contracts, that's what created this big contango. But then at the end of March, it turned out Barclays was selling unregistered shares. So they had to roll back and, 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 and basically unwind some of those those contracts um, because typically what happens is like in an ETF when you when you you have to be able to create more shares typically you have them in a in a at a pool um, authorized amount of shares that 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 have been registered well they were taking in so much money they were selling so much shares that were actually selling unregistered shares in the market so. That could have actually started some selling that started maybe back in 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 April um, uh, because they had announced that in their quarterly report. Um, and that's could have be why the the futures market started selling off and then you went into this backwardation. Um, it, it it's that's the part of the market that makes it very difficult for, you know, like you and I to kind of get a full comprehension of right off the bat, because you know, we're always looking for what's moving the market, what's causing certain things to happen. And you think it's okay, it's banks, it's the Fed, it's this or that. But sometimes it just happens to be where you know certain things happen um, that you don't really know necessarily right up front, but it's like now that you finally read it three weeks later, like, oh, okay, that makes sense. But I, I think that's what may have happened because you also at the same time, the reason why I say, uh, 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 you saw a big move of institutional money into commodities, but in t typically they don't go into actual physical commodities just because they, you know, they may not be allowed to. They have to go through a, some type of structured security or, or a structured note or, or a structured product. Wall Street will create these products um, for them. And we saw a massive, and I put this on my Twitter feed, a massive amount of, of, uh, 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 I guess increase in the precious metals category of the bank, uh, in the bank uh, OCC uh, reports, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the bank call reports that came out. You saw a massive increase. I think it went from like 30 billion to 300 billion uh, with JP Morgan alone. I mean, just just a massive amount of increase of notional derivative activity. Uh, and that actually, I did some digging into that, and it. You know, some of these programs that they create are these buffered securities and that became very popular actually in December, starting in December, going into the first quarter, a lot of institutions said, you know what, I'd rather have some participation in, say, silver, for example, but I want to base, basically have uh, some downside protection. Uh, and I'll give up some of my upside to have some of that downside protection. So, for example, some of these, how these work, they, they you know, they they call it like buffered notes. Uh, there's some pretty crazy names out there, but, but basically, the first 20% of the of the move to the downside, you're protected, but you only gain 80% of the move to the upside, uh, and then you're given a yield to hold that 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 note or that derivative uh, security, and so. Uh, uh, and then, then these are also callable notes, and the 
and you're going to like this, the one who actually creates the note, like if it's whether it's Bank of America, JP Morgan, Merrill Lynch, whoever it may be, they are also the price setter uh, for those notes as well. So think of the big short uh, in the scenario where the mar housing market's going down and all of a sudden, um, uh, uh, you know, they're all trying to understand why is my, my contract's not going up in price. Uh, well, that's the same type of thing. Th these notes can be called in if it's going against the house, so to speak. Um, and, and, and that's, that's partly what we saw as well. So, so there's, you, you just try to understand this stuff and you try to make reasoning out of it. So you don't jump to these, it's easy to jump to conclusions and, and the conspiracy side, but you know, if you could try to reason this stuff out, it helps to understand the flow of the market. Yeah. And it, it's certainly interesting what you mentioned of all these different derivative products, which I don't know, I guess, uh, JP Morgan executives, while they're waiting their RICO charges, you got to do something. Although well, similar, you pointed out uh, a couple of days ago, how GLD stuck a clause in there saying, basically, we may not deliver gold for any reason, or if it's impractical, which seems like a lot of, I mean, a, a very dangerous clause, if you're actually wanting any sort of true physical exposure and I think a lot of money goes into these things. Like you said, Wall Street, they don't want to have the actual gold bars or silver bars. So it's really expanding the supply for the demand. Um, and we'll see what happens. Uh, again, the fact that Russia has invoked gold as money to some degree, I'm guessing they're a little more interested in the real commodity. But uh, last one before we wrap up, Bob, just in general, you know, all right, we have assets selling off. We have the Fed hiking. People are concerned about that. On the other hand, inflation is still soaring despite the Fed hikes. I think people are concerned. They don't know what to think, but I, I hear from more people who are getting into metals for the first time because it's like, this doesn't look good. What's the general tone of what you're hearing from the investors out there? Um, there's certainly a lot of concern. The, 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 worry, the worry isn't necessarily um, this move down in the markets. I mean, that this is... People that are looking at physical metal are really looking out five years from now, three years from now. They're looking at the political uncertainty. They're looking at tax policy. They're looking at social policy. I mean, it's it's you know the next six weeks. You know, to them, it's you know you know they may try to you know get a better price on something or try to wait for for some type of move that tells them when to get in or out. But but for the most part, I think more people are kind of waking up to the fact that. I think the big concern, if you had to kind of, you know, if there's one reason to buy gold and silver right now, I think it, it would, and I always am one that says, listen, if you can't write the idea on the back of a business card, it's not worth investing in. So I, I keep life really simple. I've been doing that for 30 years, managing money. Um, if <clears throat> I think that the, the, the true concern right now is basically if the Fed is forced to accommodate the markets before they can get inflation under control, I think you're looking at the potential of a serious political uh, uh, event happening uh, in our country. Uh, because at that point, they're going to try and save the banking system or save save investors before uh, before putting the consumer potentially at at you know in their standard of living at more risk. And I think that that sets the ground for instability. Uh, and political change, and that's what I worry about. You know, but that you know that we don't have any control over that. I mean, as a precious, as people look into try and protect themselves, that's what gold really. I think if you look at why it would really shine, uh, it would really be because of uncertainty or political unrest, not necessarily inflation, uh, because the Fed is trying to attack that. It's the moment that the market realizes that the Fed can't really attack inflation anymore. Uh, because if they do, they're going to destroy the system. Um, and then that's that margin of change or margin of error that starts to set them in motion, the public's sentiment change for why to own metals. They get more people than just 10% of the public, for example, to own physical metal. That may start growing, uh, uh, you know, in terms of awareness. Yeah, well put. And I, I also appreciate how you mentioned that a lot of the people who are buying gold and silver are not as concerned about what's happening next week or six months from now. I, I know that's hard for many people yet. 
I think there's a lot to be said. I, I don't know what's going to happen the next year, but I see Joe Biden out there doing a Frank Drebin, stumbling through saying inflation, according to the Fed, is the strength of the economy. I'm like, well, that's not a very good strength. And you see the debt has not gone anywhere. So there's a big elephant that has not left the room. And I don't think there's a door he can fit out of. So either case, great, great talk today, Bob. And perhaps before we wrap up, you could just let people know how they can find you, uh, perhaps on Twitter and also the website. Yeah, a website is goldsilvervault.com, just all one word. And then on Twitter, it's Profits Plus ID. So P R O F I T S P L U S I D uh, on Twitter. Um, and then, yeah, we also put out there uh, our, uh, you know, I'll put on Twitter our website uh, in terms of, or I'm sorry, on Twitter, prices of metals that we, we sell for, because I act more of a purchaser representative for clients rather than a dealer, so to speak. So, you know, our job is to try and get the best price for the client. Uh, and we tend to have the best price. I've been told by a lot of people, some of the best prices in the country. So it's, it's helpful, or we like to try and help people save money, but also uh, get them more educated on why to buy metals uh, in the first place. So they have a chance, uh, you know, by, by getting a cheaper price, they have a better chance of making money. And that's what it's all about. Well, I do appreciate that and think there's a lot to be said for education. I know I have a silver channel, although I always try and phrase it not to be telling anybody else what to do, but giving the information and how I ended up in this place. And you do a great job of that as well. So great to catch up with you, Bob. Thanks for all the information you shared today. And we'll look forward to doing this again soon. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Well, thank you, Bob, for that update. And thanks to everyone at home for watching. Sure appreciate you being here. And just wanted to let you know that if you did have questions, if you'd like to ask me or interact with some of the other people in the Arcadian audience, we're actually going to be hosting our first office hours next Thursday, June 23rd at 6 p.m. Eastern. That'll be a private Zoom call, but it's free to attend. And we'll just be talking silver. Rob Keens of Gold Silver Pros will be joining us. Also, David Stein from Kuya Silver. So if you have questions for him, just wanted to create a way to allow people to interact more, make some new silver friends. And the sign up link for that is in the description field below. It's absolutely free to attend. And we'd love to meet you there and talk some silver and have some fun. So, again, that's next Thursday, June 23rd at 6 p.m. Eastern for Arcadia Office Hours. And I'll look forward to seeing you there. Mm -hmm.